Tamayan Sasa Bay Libsha, Kahime Shenora or Dus, or Gus An Sasa Bay Dashan Urkuron, Bill Clinton, or Gus Arkarja, or Gus Tamay Puik Bosta, the Nadinia Corona called Spicita, the Hela, or Gus Koharaha, the Marty Glennon. I want, if I may, I want, if I may, to dedicate my remarks this evening to our friend, Rita O'Hare and her family. Rita spent 20 years here working for uh, Sinn Féin as our representative. Also want to say on a happier note, happy birthday, Shannon Eaton. And I want to thank the Irish American organization which sponsored tonight's events. And I want to thank especially President Bill Clinton for your attendance. and for your critically important and ongoing contribution to the Irish peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. And thanks also to Congress member Richie Neal, who's been a steadfast supporter. And I was delighted to see Senator uh, Mitchell, our good friend, whose patience and good humor and wisdom helped to guide us through many difficult days. George once told myself and Martin McGuinness that achieving the agreement was the easy bit. The hard part would be implementing it. And he was right. However, despite the ups and downs over the last 25 years, we're in a much better place today than we were during the decades of conflict. So let's look briefly at how the latest phase of that conflict started. And I give you the short version. I come from Ballamurphy in Belfast. No one from my community went to war. The war came to us. In the 1960s, some of us demanded our civil rights, modest and moderate demands for equality and an end to discrimination and gerrymandering. The unionist regime said no. They were supported by the English government in London in 1969, the people of the North awoke to find ourselves once again under military occupation. This was the last for almost 30 years. The English government handed power over to their military elites. It was a brutal, repressive, and murderous regime. The Irish government unfortunately assumed the role of junior partner with the British. And the efforts of the British state were to contain a popular uprising and to suppress all opposition. And there were many hard efforts by many good people to find peaceful ways forward. And they all failed. If the militarists who ran the British system had prevailed, there would be no, and there would not have been a peace process. Not 25 years ago, not ever. A terrible war continued until it was brought to an end at Easter 1998, despite their best efforts. Now, since then, over half a million people have been born in the North. They and many others have never known violence unless personally touched by an event. Many are alive today who may otherwise have been killed. And that is the legacy Irish America and all of you in this room could be proud of. You, President Clinton, all of your positive representatives, Irish America helped to bring peace to Ireland. <clears throat> the Irish peace process was the work of many people. But for Sinn Féin, the roots of the Irish Republican engagement with the search for peace is to be found in our decision in the late 1970s to challenge those who had hijacked that word. They had hijacked the word 
peace. They were presenting peace as something they were for and that Irish Republicans were against. We challenged this. We argued that peace required justice. They argued that peace meant defeating Irish nationalists and Republicans. We argued for talks to achieve peace and against the exclusion of anyone. They dismissed this. In the early 1980s, our efforts were assisted by Father Alex Reed and Father Des Wilson, two Catholic priests based in Belfast. They pioneered the process of conflict resolution and preached the gospel of dialogue. They were lone voices. The Irish and British governments were locked into strategies of containment. The British locked into strategies of militarization as well. Their focus was on demonizing and isolating Republicans. Sinn Féin was an illegal organization for much of this time. We were censored, and although we continued to increase our electoral support, the rights of our voters were taken away by the government. Our members were assassinated. The prisons were filled. Hunger strikes and prison protests were common. British policy entrenched injustice and deepened and perpetuated the conflict. None of that worked. On the contrary, it made the challenge of peacemaking more difficult. Peace building requires a different approach. It's not simply about ending violence. To do so, it has to tackle the causes of the conflict. Sinn Féin came to understand that if we were to concede in persuading those Republicans who were involved in the armed action to stop, then we had to provide an alternative. And we soon learned that this was unlikely to come from the governments and from the good and the great. So Sinn Féin intensified our efforts to develop our own peace strategy. We published a number of documents and discussion papers, including scenario for peace and towards a lasting peace. These identified self-determination as central to creating the conditions for peace. The people of Ireland have never relinquished our claim to the right of self-determination, but that right was denied us by London. Rectifying this Sinn Féin resolve needed to be at the core of a genuine peace process. There also had to be a mechanism to give effect to this. So the exercise of self-determination, along with the need to end London's Government of Ireland Act, became central to our peacemaking efforts. And we also revised our view of the role of the Irish government. We asserted that Dublin had a clear responsibility and an Irish constitutional obligation to establish an Irish national democracy. And we argued that an Irish government needed to have a strategy as a sovereign government of persuading the British that partition has failed. And both governments need to be persuading the unionists that reunification will benefit them. We also argued that the Irish government should use its international outreach to support peace and Irish national rights, and that Dublin should defend the democratic rights of people in the North. So we increased our efforts to promulgate these positions, and it's very hard to do when you're underground very hard to do when you're censored and when you're in many ways uh, kept away from the normal processes of political activism. But we did strive to find common ground with others on these propositions. In the meantime, the war continued. The IRA was very active. So were British forces, including their surrogates within unionist paramilitaries. Atrocity followed atrocity. By now, Sinn Féin had sizable political strength, and we demanded all party talks. We reached out once again to our diaspora, and particularly to Irish America. Around this time, the British government reopened secret back-channel talks with us, even as they denied talking to us. Being a foil also began a dialogue, and Father Alex Reid was central to all this. In 19 1986, he arranged my first meeting, my first private meeting with John Hume. Listen. Listen to this, folks. That was 11 years before the
the Good Friday Agreement. 11 long, bloody years. And when eventually our talks became public, John Hume was pilloried by the British and Irish establishment and by many in the British and Irish media. And John demonstrated great courage in sticking with what became known as the Hume-Adams Agreement. And throughout our conversations and in our joint statements, John and I identified self-determination as key to building an alternative to armed actions. Through the hard work of many Irish American organizations and individuals, including Richie Neal, Tom Mannion, Peter King, Ben Gilman, Chris Dodd, Teddy Kennedy, and many more on Capitol Hill, and alongside the pioneering work of Bill Flynn, Chuck Feeney, Bruce Morrison, Neil O'Dowd, and Joe Jamison, the cause of Ireland and the peace in Ireland became an important, pivotal political issue here in the USA. President Clinton's decision to give me a 48-hour visa in January 1994 was a critical initiative in the peace process. Up to this point, the British position was that the North was an internal matter for the British government. President Bill Clinton changed that. In doing so, he went against the advice of the State Department, senior politicians here, and some of his own senior officials, including the FBI and the CIA. And a furious British Prime Minister refused to speak to him for almost a week. President Clinton's initiative, along with John Hume and then Taoiseach Albert Reynolds and Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith, helped put in place the building blocks of an alternative that Martin and McGuinness and I were able to bring to the IRA leadership. In August 94, the IRA called a cessation. Seamus Heaney described this as a space in which hope can grow. It was a prescient comment from a great Irish poet and a writer. Less than four years later, all party talks commenced after some difficulties under Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, and Taoiseach Bertie O'Hearn, and all of the political parties except the DUP, which refused to attend. George Mitchell masterfully managed all of the competing positions. And President Clinton played a key role by staying in constant contact with all the contributors and committing the USA to be a guarantor to the agreement. On 10th of April, Good Friday, 1998, the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement was achieved. It's the most important political agreement of our time in Ireland. The twists and turns from then to now have been many. Currently, the institutions are suspended due to the intransigence of the DUP and the machinations of successive Tory governments in London. This is totally and absolutely unacceptable. The results of the last election to the Northern Assembly need to be respected. The Democratic Unionist Party need to take up their ministerial posts with the rest of us. And if the two governments remain intransigent, then, sorry, if the DUP remain intransigent, then the two governments should move ahead using the Good Friday Agreement, all Ireland mechanisms. We cannot have a return to direct rule from London. It is not an option. The agreement has mechanisms, has political architecture, and both governments should use those to move forward. And the government also and the government also needs to implement elements of the agreement that have still not been put in place, including a Bill of Rights for the North. The Tory government should scrap its flawed and offensive legacy bill. It should implement the agreement on legacy reached 10 years ago. We appreciate the work done by President Biden to defend the Good Friday Agreement. People 
in Ireland still need the White House to act as guarantor, as President Clinton did, and as he vowed the US would do, and as President Biden continues to do. Embedded in that agreement is the right of the people of Ireland to decide our future. Our future, that decision, doesn't belong to an English government or indeed to the DUP. For the first time in our history, there's a peaceful way to end the union with England and to build our own future. And no one should be allowed to take that right away from us. The Irish government should establish a citizens assembly or a series of such assemblies to discuss the process of constitutional change and the measures needed to build an all Ireland economy, a truly national health service, an education system, and all the other needs of society. And we need national reconciliation. We need a citizen-centered rights-based society, including the rights of our unionist neighbors and the Orange Order and other loyal institutions. The protections of the Good Friday Agreement are their protections also. The island of Ireland is their land, their home place. The unionists are our neighbors. We want them to become our friends. Sinn Féin, under the leadership of Mary Lou Macdonald and Michelle O'Neill, is committed to upholding everyone's rights and to working with them, with the unionists, to make the island of Ireland a better place for every citizen. And it's my sense, and it's been always my sense, that we have the wit and the intelligence and the, the ability and the right to build a society which can accommodate and celebrate our differences and our diversity. Look at what's happening in other parts of the world. Reflect for a second at the horror which is happening in other troubled places. Very few countries get the chance to begin anew. Ireland, North and South has that chance. So despite the current difficulties, the future looks bright. What is needed is the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, including a date and the, the appropriate planning for the unity referendum. My friends, we are in a decade of opportunity. It has to be a decade of persuasion. The Good Friday Agreement created a democratic and peaceful path to Irish reunification. The great and the good used to say peace was not possible. And I give you this part of history to illustrate what a lot of us have come through. Some now say that unity is not possible. As Madiba said, some things are impossible until they're done. So unity is now a doable project. And with the continuing support of Irish America, we together can make it Happen. And it, it's not inevitable. It needs hard work. But when we do the hard work, it's then we see the rising of the moon. Thank you.